it's no secret that Fort Collins is a great place to live. And for me, it's the perfect place to raise my family. And a big part of that is because Fort Collins is a safe community. But even in the safest of communities, bad things do happen. And when they do, you want help and you want it fast. We know that when you call us, it's your worst day. It may be the biggest emergency and the only time in a person's life that they have a contact with the police or crime. So of course, it's a very big deal. 911, what is the address of the emergency? When you call 911, the last thing you're thinking about is data and statistics. But in order for us to respond to that emergency, data and statistics are exactly what we need. So much of what we do here in the fire service is emotional. And at some point, you have to take a lot of the emotion out and you have to have facts and figures and pure data to justify either training or equipment or whatever we do. Many people ask, what, what is the one thing in policing you have to have or else you will never be a success? Data and information. You know, it wasn't always this way. When Chief Mulligan started with Poudre Fire Authority in the early 80s. We could tell good war stories and we had some really great stories to tell, but it was hard to really get your arms around how effective you were. And then how did you compare against your peers? That's another kind of thing I think you need to know. Because if you're weak against your peers, then you've got a lot, a long way to go. And you should be probably looking to borrow some stuff from them to get better. One of the, the tools that we use is called the Benchmark City Survey, which is 27 like cities across the United States, similar size, university towns, those types of things that gives us a good benchmark. Your productivity was how many feet of ladders you raised during the year. How many feet of hose did you lay out on the ground? Well, those are measurements of activities, but they aren't measurements of effectiveness. We work very hard to develop more meaningful things like uh, based on how many dollars of value are in your community. Uh, if it's $2 billion worth of buildings, how much of it do you lose? Another one is population and lives lost. How many officers need to be out there and what should they be working on at any given time? Over what period of time? Where in town? So yeah, data in, in this entirety of this department, what we do from the budgeting sense, how we spend the tax dollars that we get uh, from the general fund, but how many people we hire, all those kinds of things, those data sets matter. How many people are working, when and where, is critical to getting you help when and where you need it. In an emergency, like a violent crime, the average police response time is about four minutes. Conversely, if it's a lower priority because compared to a violent crime, it's a lower priority, people can wait hours to see an actual officer. A pedestrian was struck by a car and they're in critical condition. She was already in the ambulance before we got here. Okay, so Tess is heading down there. Uh, Rob's talking to the driver. Do we want them to do that or should we have them keep the uh, No, have them keep that here until okay. the crash gets here. We have to keep the scene as sterile as we can until the right resources get here and those resources are going to be the crash team. They're going to suit up, get in their vehicles and they're going to come straight here and they'll start their investigation they'll take it over. These guys clearly have this figured out and stabilized until the crash arrives. So I go back to my computer and I look at what calls are holding, what other calls are officers on that they, they may need resources on because my job is to make sure that we can have as many resources as we can available um, so when emergency calls come in we can respond to those. 911, what's the address of the emergency? Yeah, I want you to stay away from them, okay? I don't want you to get involved in that fight, okay? Yeah, we've got a lot of officers headed that way. We've got EMS standing by outside, so they'll be there very shortly. We have our police channel. That the suspect nailed did have a knife on him. And they track all the officers out in the field. Hold it right there, police! My job is to look at how many officers do I need to adequately handle that call. Sam 123, I need two more units, please. Suspect just barricaded in the house. And I can tell you, as a sergeant, I, I have a cannon officer who's assigned to my team. Um, I always want him and his partner going. Yeah, you got kids in the house and the suspect's in the house with a knife. We'll hold the perimeter right here in this corner, okay? Never mind the amount of officers to approach that home. Uh, they've, got, they've got someone at gunpoint at the front door on the west side of the house. That's your guy right there. He came at uh, one guy with a, one guy he went after with a knife, another guy he hit the head with a pipe. Okay. Um, we've got both victims, they both ID'd him. He has an ambulance coming. If you guys can go up to the fence where they were and see if they need, Mark Martinez is running that and make sure that he doesn't need anybody else helping to clear that house. If you look around at how many resources you have here, how many police officers you have, it's quite a few. Over the course of time, we'll go back five, 10 years and look at call load activity. 
how much time that we're actually, the officers are spending on specific calls in specific areas of town. And we take that so we know what hours of the day and what days of the week are the busiest and how many officers it takes to be able to service those customers. If somebody calls 911, we've got to be able to answer that call. Um, we call that saturation levels. What's our probability of saturation? What's the probability that somebody will call 911 and we have nobody available to respond? We need to be able to address that and then we can go out from there to say, okay, do we have enough resources to do, say, proactive work? And we're trying to marry those two and accommodate those two. The, both the reactive, the demand for service, and the proactive. We're going out, we're targeting school zones and traffic enforcement. The officers go out and, and do footwork and get to know their community, but in tight budget times, something's gotta give, and it will be the proactive work that we'll give first. Here's the thing. You and I, we don't really ever see the scary stuff that happens. What we do see are things like graffiti, traffic violations, and I know everyone's had a neighbor who had a really noisy party. And we want the police to take care of those things. And where they can, we want them to be proactive too. For example, downtown after dark. Downtown is one of my favorite places in Fort Collins. It's a great place to bring the kids and enjoy lunch on the patio. But come nightfall, it gets a little bit darker, people are enjoying themselves, more people are downtown, you add alcohol to that mix and things can get a little rowdy. Now District 1 has been patrolling this area for years. With the Downtown After Dark program, we are connecting all of the bars through information technology. And here's the cool thing. Bars will be able to communicate with each other with a new information system. So if one bar has a disorderly or unruly patron inside and they decide to remove them, they can send a message to the other bars letting them know, okay, this, this person here is no longer permitted to be inside the, our bar. We highly suggest you don't let him inside your bar. It's not just the bars, it's not just the businesses, it's not just the police, it's not just any one aspect but we literally have a community effort from the courts to the parks department to the businesses down who really want to try to keep this and make this as wonderful a place as it is. Another goal of the police department is to try and stop traffic accidents before they happen. We keep records of all the traffic accidents, what happened and where. Then we analyze that data to determine what actually caused those accidents. We deploy police officers to the high accident intersections and we ask them to start looking for those specific violations that are causing the accidents. And the best way to fight a fire is not to start one in the first place. And that's the job of the Fire Prevention Bureau and the Fire Marshal. I mean, take this building behind me. It's actually amazing when you think about all the different elements that go into designing a building that are put in place just to keep it safe. We look at the streets, we look at the width of the streets, we look at the distances, we look at where the buildings are placed so that we can provide fire protection to it. Street names, fire hydrants, building addresses. Oh, dark 30, it's very difficult to find a place with an address, let alone find a place that isn't addressed. So the objective of the fire code and the fire departments is to have it designed in such a way with sprinklers, passive protection, which is a sheetrock, the floor layout, the doors, so that if a fire occurs, it's contained there so that when the fire department arrives, they're dealing with less fire. That's a big deal for us. Prevention is important, but no matter how prepared we are, emergencies happen. Emergencies, by definition, require a quick response, and they also require the right response, and that starts in dispatch. 911, what's the address of your emergency? Dispatch is the first responders for anyone calling in on 911 or any other emergency situation. They take phone calls coming in, they triage the call, provide emergency medical dispatching instructions if necessary, gather enough information so we can classify the call and send out first responders, whether it be police, fire, or EMS. We try to respond to people's homes under five minutes, and we, they actually print out our times and give them to us, so we like to be fast. We're, we're proud of how fast we get out of the door. A lot of times we'll arrive on scene first so that way we can start care for the patient um, before the ambulance gets there. You know you have four to six minutes when someone's heart stops to intercede before permanent brain damage sets in if there's a chance of survival. So we try to get into that four to six minutes in our response which just kind of coincides with the flashover thing too. What we know about fire is the quicker you get to it and start fighting it the smaller the loss. Fire has an exponential curve. A very, very small room and a fire that occurs from a candle, from a trash can, from an electrical outlet, from any kind of an accident, fire begins very slowly. And what really happens is what you'll see is 
will start to get the smoke and it'll go to the ceiling and it starts to bank. And then what you'll get is all that smoke will get preheated and the fire itself will ignite all that smoke. And depending on how much oxygen, how large the room is, and the products are inside that room, you can have everything from what we call kind of a, a rollover where it's a very volatile wash of fire that comes across the ceiling to a flashover which literally ignites the whole ceiling all at one time or literally a backdraft where the proper mixtures are in place and the room literally explodes. And that rolls outside the door, say if it's in a room, like a bedroom, it would roll outside the door and, and that's at that point where now it's free burning and, and it's going to increase dramatically from there. With national data we've collected that in about four to five minutes that flashover could occur. So we're trying to get there before the flashover occurred. As you crawl in that door, you've only got a minute or two, if you're lucky, before that whole room lights up. On you. So you have to be able to get to the seat of the fire quick enough, put the water where it needs to be quick enough, or you could find yourself in that event. If we're coming to another station or another area or we have to coverage, if we're, if we're over five minutes, we, do, we have to put a note in our report on why it took us longer to get there, whether it was a train, whether it was traffic, coverage from another area, things like that. And any time that we look at building a station, you know, that's part of the, that data, that statistic that we look at. We look at number of runs, we look at how long it takes those companies that currently cover that area to respond there and that's kind of how we start targeting where we need to have a station. Station 4 is a good example where we had an area to the very far northwest part of their area they couldn't get to and we knew when we wanted to build the new station we knew it needed to go north as opposed to going south so we had to look for a north location so it wasn't just a matter of finding an empty lot it was about where our runs were, what our times were, and that was what driven where that station location was going to be. And then, of course, there's the use of data to solve crimes. If we have a latent from a crime scene, and a latent is the unknown that's recovered from the evidence, then we can search this database to see if we can identify the unknown latent print. It allows us to be able to search millions of fingerprints through a computer instead of having to do it manually. But even though the database can narrow it down, it still takes a human to make the final identification. In the mornings when we come in, we check our lockers to see what been left overnight. Looks like an officer logged some stuff in here. We keep track of everything in property and evidence by using the barcode system and it's important for us because we need to know that we have accountability as to how it runs through the chain of evidence from when we collect it to when we get into the final disposition of that item through the case. People can bring up reports through our records management system. What's in evidence? What's at the lab? When we enter the data in the system, there are several ways we enter it. If it's a police report, such as a theft of a bicycle, once it's entered in there, everybody in the department has access to that information, as well as the other agencies that are on this computer system with us. Real to almost real time crime data that's going on around the nation. So yes, that data is our lifeblood. We have made so many cases off of being able to use data analyze data in a timely way. My detective sergeants have their areas of responsibility and, and daily they check the calls and they look at them. They look at every single call that pertains to their area to see if there's some way that the investigations division would assist the patrol division. It comes down to the detectives taking really good interviews of any suspects they get, turning that information over to patrol. Patrol working with our crime analyst as she goes through and takes every single report and puts a fine pencil to it to look at it and say, where's thematically this going? We had a very prolific series of vehicle trespasses going on in the city. And we started to read some police reports and talk to some of the victims. So we were able to discern a couple of different patterns that were going on, where those were occurring, what days of the week those were occurring, and hours of the day, and then target those areas. And so we put officers on foot in those neighborhoods, and within a month period, we were able to catch these people in the act, and we did do that several times over. Being in the right place at the right time isn't just luck. It's about having enough people and knowing when and where to use them. Every station has an engine. What an engine's job is to do is just to put out the fire. I mean, they carry the fire hose. They also run all the medicals and all of the day-to-day -day emergency calls that come through, you know, the fire alarms and whatnot. 
tower is what we call our support apparatus. There's an engine manned by an engine company at each of Cooter Fire Authority's 13 stations. However, there's only two towers, or what we used to call ladder trucks, there's only two for the entire community. Our roles are a little bit different than the engine companies. We respond to all fires, uh, technical rescues, motor vehicle extrications. Um, of course, we're all trained as EMTs, so when Engine 1, who we share a station with, is out on a call, we respond to medical emergencies as well. We have a, a pretty low ratio of firefighters per capita compared to our comparisons. And that's a, an effectiveness measure to some extent because we're doing more with less, but we're concerned at this point in time that we're, we're, we're pushing the edge on that. All of our engine companies are staffed with three personnel. They're starting to do a lot of studies across the country and finding that four personnel are much more efficient than three. It takes a minimum of two people to deploy an inch and three quarter hose. That's an inch and three quarter in diameter. And it takes another person to pump it and that person has to stay at the apparatus to pump that. So that's bare minimum that we can safely do that. When we add that fourth person, that frees up the captain, who is the decision maker, who makes tactical decisions, to make tactical decisions rather than having his hands involved in the task at hand. Command engine five, make an entry part three, third floor. If I get too involved in a task function, I'm not able to do that. I'm not able to stay back and really grasp what's going on. We really try and avoid that as much as we can or do it at, for as short a period of time as we can. If we had more resources on individual pieces of equipment, we could actually respond less fire trucks to get us the resources that we need to accomplish the same goal. The benefit to that is what it does is it leaves us more fire trucks available for the next emergency. Police and fire use data to make sure they have the right people in the right place at the right time with the right equipment. They are analyzing every major event to find ways to improve. And they're looking at the data behind medical emergencies, fires, the community, crime, to try and do their jobs better. What's really important and what really makes the difference are the men and women who are keeping Fort Collins safe. These guys love their job, they work hard, and they want to be here. We set up and manage so that they can do a good job, so that we have the right equipment for them, they're in the right place, they've got the right tools based on the data that we see so, so they're well prepared to do what they're going to do.